Hello. So I'm going live on YouTube, Hydraulist, and uh, if you want to, so join the, the YouTube channel, Hydraulist, and there'll be a slight delay, probably about a three second delay or so. So if you can hear me, uh, please type back in the Jitsi chat that you can hear me. Please let me know if you can hear me by typing back into the Jitsi chat. Excellent. Okay, so that's a good sign that that the sound is working. So now, today I want to talk about what is a camera, how a camera works, and, and, and all that kind of thing. So I want to go through just the fundamentals of what what a camera is, how a camera works, and um, as I move over to the other table, let me know if the audio is still good. So if I come over here, now I'll just switch. So this is my main camera and focus maybe about that far away. And so this is the main camera and so I've got the whiteboard table over here and then a bit further over I've got the chalkboard table. And so that's what I will be presenting from and go down to F8 and I can probably drop this. Down to maybe something reasonable. So now I'm going to switch to my, I've got my video switcher here, I'm just going to switch to the chalkboard camera and then go to live picture in picture. Yeah. So the general idea, I want to talk about what a camera is fundamentally and what a camera senses or measures from a very simple point of view. We have here some Vuzix blades, smart glasses, and these smart glasses are, uh, of course they have camera system in them, display, television, augmented reality, mediated reality, or what we call X-reality, XR. And so this, these are available for sign out, so especially if, if any of you have a little bit of Android experience and you're also good at hacking, it's not straight up ordinary Android. It's going to take a little bit of, of uh, skill, I guess, to kind of get things to work on there. But if you're good at kind of hacking Android, uh, then this would be perfect for you. And I've also got some smart swims here too, which are, these are the, the swim glass, which are the underwater extended reality. And we have the muses here, which actually can cause the human eye itself to function as a camera. If you look at that research paper that we wrote, uh, where the human eye itself becomes the camera, these muse brain sensing headbands perform that, can perform that function. Typically at University of Toronto classes start about 10 minutes after the hour, so we'll give a couple of minutes for people to kind of file in and make their, make their way in here. examples of cameras, the eyeglasses with the camera in it, and all these other devices, the reality glass, this is the underwater virtual reality glass. These are all examples of imaging systems. 
course, I've got lots of camera examples here that I'll be discussing. Cameras, lenses, how cameras work, what is an aperture, all those kinds of things. Okay, I think we can just about begin another minute or so. Let's get started. So what is a camera? That's kind of a fundamental question we could ask. Set these smart swings to one side for the time being. fundamental question here is what is a camera? So the word camera comes from the Latin concept camera obscura kind of a Latin phrase meaning dark room Camera means room in Latin, and obscura means dark. So oftentimes you see meetings are in camera. An in camera meeting means it's inside a closed room, you know, private. So this concept of a dark room is at the history of photography in its earliest days. And of course, in the earliest days of, of cameras, a camera was simply a dark room. We would often have maybe a, a, a room so you'd have a room that was a dark room, like this, completely dark. And outside, you might have some subject matter outside the room. And <clears throat> so yeah, the world is outside here. And what people noticed is if there's a little opening in the room, like if you've ever noticed if you have your window blinds closed and there's a little opening where the light can come in. Sometimes the blinds don't close all the way and there's a little opening. What you'll see over on this other wall is an image of whatever's outside there. So you might see a person's feet here and their arms here and their head and you might see, you know, the sun in the sky or whatever it is cast upon this opposite wall here. So you see there's an image formed on the wall and that simple algebraic projective geometry if we have a, a, a camera with an opening here and the screen here, I haven't drawn the whole room, but uh, we, we can see that rays of light come from various points of the person's head. The top of their head is going to land right here and the bottom of the feet are going to land over here and the arms are going to land here and what you'll have is a picture of that person portrayed on this opposite wall here and so what we would see is exactly what's outside imaged on the wall and in fact painters used to do that and draw paintings the use of these cameras kind of came into popular use in the during the Renaissance. And you see a lot of Renaissance painters would draw things 
that were obviously imaged, you know, with a camera system, where the painting canvas or drawing paper is affixed in sort of a dark room. So you would draw, you know, if you were a painter, you'd set up a tent, a black tent, with a little opening in the in there, a cloth, and then you would close it all out and black it all out, and it's quite dim in there, and you'd put a white screen or a white canvas here and have a little opening here, and whatever you saw, you would paint on that canvas or paint on the wall. And in this way, the image would be formed through drawing or painting. And so there is a word uh, um, in Greek um, in that, that word is you know, light, phos, or photos in Greek means light. And there's another word in Greek, graphe, which means to draw or to paint, you know, graphing, graph paper. Drawing a graph comes from that word. So photography um, is, is a word in Greek, that means painting or drawing with light. That's what the word means. So in English, we would call it light painting or light drawing. In Greek, we call it photography, photographe. And so the word photography uh, simply means to draw or paint with light. And that's kind of what people had this idea is that nature's pencil. You know, the idea was to, to make drawings or paintings or images that are drawn by nature itself. And so the idea was to put some kind of material here that's sensitive to light, because people knew that they could paint, and by hand they could put something on that, w on that wall and make an image by hand. But the great breakthrough or the great discovery was how to make an image from nature itself without human intervention other than setting up the apparatus and thus record scientifically perhaps what's actually present in the way of light, an image of what's present. And so historically people knew, uh, there, there's a, an interesting history here in, 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 in photography. Um, recently my roof was leaking and I've had a lot of trouble with my roof during the pandemic and you can't find anybody to fix it because there's a shortage of labor. So I had to fix my roof myself. <coughs> and so I'm up there on the roof and you got all these, this is a bitumen roofing tar. And you can see here, the stones have worn away in places. And on the roof, there's stones or gravel on the roof. It looks like a beach. Whenever I'm up on my roof, I imagine myself being on a beach. Here's another piece of my roof. See, it looks like a beach. And so, life's a beach when you're on the roof. Did anybody stop to wonder why these rooftops are beaches? You know, I love sitting on flat roofs, by the way, because it's like being on a beach. If you can't get to the beach, at least I can get up on the roof and get some sun and prevent COVID, hopefully, or get a little bit of vitamin D and help live healthier lifestyle. But, you know, if you put your bathing suit on and go up on a roof and you're sitting on this gravel, you might be asking yourself, well, why, are, why is there gravel on the roof? And the answer is very, very simple. There's gravel on the roof, stones, because this bitumen is easily damaged by exposure to light. So this is uh, roof tower or bitumen is, is damaged from sunlight. And so to protect it from the sunlight, it's covered with stones or gravel. And over time, the gravel maybe wears off due to abrasion from ice, winter, shifting freeze-thaw cycles, and so on. And then the light hits this and deteriorates it, and it starts to crack. So in 1826, um, some enterprising individual uh, decided to try and put some roofing materials in one of these boxes with an opening at one side and light landing on the other. <laughs> and the roofing material that was used was bitumen of Judea applied to a pewter dinner plate. And over a long time, like a full day of exposure in bright sunlight, that 
plate, dinner plate, was washed in mineral spirits. And some of the uh, areas of the plate that had become hardened from exposure to light remained and other areas washed away. And so what was the result of that was the world's first, um, at least known in many ways, there's some, always going to be some controversy about who took the first photograph, but many people believe that that was the world's first photograph in 1826, taken on bitumen of Judea roofing materials. So when you're standing on a roof, sunbathing on the roof, uh, think about that. That's the first photographic light-sensitive material. And more generally, light-sensitive materials uh, like this, this is a thin light sensitive material called film, and you can see here there is a little bit of this, this strip of material here. I think I can, I think you can see that there's little holes in it, perforations to advance it along from one exposure to the next. It comes in rolls, and I used to buy a lot of this stuff. This was one of my favorite, Actar 25, 25 ISO, uh, Kodak Actar 25 ISO exposure film. And so that film, if you put photographic light sensitive material in here, it will form an image. So your first lab, you're gonna, we're going to build a camera and understand what it really is. What is a camera? A camera obscura is a dark room. And for the first lab, you're going to build two cameras, a small one and a big one, to understand the effect of size. So the small one is going to be, you're going to build it in a box like this. So if this was your box here, I'll just trace the outline of that box here on the chalkboard. This is a real slate chalkboard from a classroom that's about 100 years old. And I've got Hagarome of chalk, the best chalk that was ever made in human history. And a really nice slate chalkboard, so it's, it's a good way to present. The box here, you can have an opening in it. <coughs> you can make an opening there. And then you're going to put a piece of white paper, or white cardboard in there. And then a subject matter outside of the box. Whatever is outside that box is, of course, going to be imaged on that card inside there. And so, if you simply make a hole in that box somewhere, if I just make a hole in there and let the light come through, of course, you'll see an image of what's on the other side of it. But of course, it has to be. Typically what you'll do here in order to see the image is you'll cut another opening in the box. You'll make another hole down here big enough to look in and see the image. Or you can put your smartphone there and photograph it through another opening and photograph the image that's on that opposite wall. So lab one will be exploring these simple ideas of what is a camera. And we can calculate the optimum size of that hole, of course. And if that hole, as the hole gets bigger, it lets in more light and the image will get brighter. But what happens if that hole is really large? If that hole is really large, the image will be quite fuzzy and ill-defined because whatever subject matter is here will form that one point, say I'll take some point P in the, in, the, in the real world, that point will image over here, it'll also image over here and here, and it'll be spread out quite a bit. To make a series, of it'll spread out, it won't be concentrated, it won't be localized. Whereas if we made a much smaller opening, let me draw the rays of light in a different color, like orange here or something. And so now you'll see that smaller opening be here, and then maybe this point here 
will form over here. And so there'll be the, the circle of confusion, as it's called, will be smaller. Now the question is, as you make the hole smaller, does it make the image sharper? And the answer is up to a certain point, yes, but beyond that, no, because there's something called diffraction that kicks in and you're going to eventually f kind of uh, come across this uh, Riley criteria or whatever. You know, 1.22 lambda over d, there's some function of wavelength. Uh, and so if you pick a mid-wavelength, like say 550 nanometers, which is roughly what the eye is most sensitive to, the green, so you're at the center of the spectrum, then you'll end up with something that you can calculate, in fact, what the diffraction criteria is, and you can calculate the optimum hole size that will produce the sharpest image. And the optimum hole size that will produce the sharpest image, because if that hole is too small, then you get diffraction where rays of light bend. And so the, right here, those rays will not necessarily go in straight lines anymore when you get close to the diffraction limit. So you have a choice. You can make the hole too big or too small, or you can make it just right. And when you make it just right, it gives you the optimum trade-off between diffraction effects and just simple geometric optics where there's a circle of confusion. Now the next innovation in photography was coming up with a way of making a better, sharper, clearer image. And so that was the invention of the lens. And so when you put a lens here, this is a lens by the way, and you can see when you're looking through that lens it almost has a magnifying effect. It sort of you can see how things are slightly magnified when you're, you can see those eyeglasses there when they go through the lens they're magnified. And so this lens goes here and that was the next big thing in photography was having having a lens. By the way, can everybody hear me uh, clearly? Just type back in the chat section if everybody can hear me clearly. I'm using a Shure SM58 with a 12 AU7 tube, vacuum tube preamp. Uh, so it should be coming through clear. I think that's pretty standard technology that's been around for many years, proven to work. Um, now, the lens here is forming the image, and of course the lens has to be focused. If you look at that lens, let's say if I were to put a light colored object here, like this, this Vuzix, uh, take this back of this Vuzix blade box, mm -hmm. and if I take that lens here, and move it towards and away from some subject matter, you can faintly see vestiges of images appearing I don't know if you can see that, but I can see out the street there very faintly see the truck go by there, I don't know if you're able to see that, but I can see the traffic on the road going by there as I as I hold this at just the right focal distance. You can actually see the building over there um, very faintly appear on that white paper. And so, uh, but it has to be in focus because before with the pinhole everything was in focus, uh, slightly, everything was visible from zero to infinity, slightly. Nothing was to very sharp, but nothing was blurry either. With a lens, what you have is extremely sharp when it's in focus and quite blurry when it's out of focus. So you have selective focus. And that can be used creatively and artistically. You see in good portraits, good pictures of people. What we often see is that you want the face to be sharp and clear and the background to be blurry so the background's not distracting. And so that... Um, that's kind of what, what people are going for in, in portrait photography, and that is a portrait lens, let's say. A big lens like that would often be used in portrait photography. Allowing us to see 
to see what's going on or see what's happening. So now, the next evolution in photography, so we have a lens here, and of course to see it well you need a dark box around it. So you can try that if you have a magnifying glass, and you can try that putting this there with a, a lens of paper. Be careful not to leave it lying around somewhere where light might shine in it and burn a hole through the paper or something if it's too bright. Um, so you don't want to leave these lenses lying around or sunlight might shine through them and things like that. But uh, what you'll have is you'll have an image that's quite clear and sharp when that lens is focused and you can experiment with that inside of one of these cameras, a, a black box. And if we look inside a, a camera, if we take a typical camera, these early cameras were just boxes. It's just a box like this, and inside the box, you know, the box has a film in it, and there's a, a photographic film that, that images. And so if I open that, you can see here, open that box. There's really not much in here, it's just a box. And in the box is pretty much nothing. And there you go. And in the box is, you push this button, and it opens the shutter for a little while and exposes it to the film. And these boxes, uh, you'll notice one thing about them, they're all different shapes and sizes. These cameras are all different shapes and sizes. But one thing that they have in common is that they're all black, as dark as possible. And in fact, when the camera is black, it can see better, uh, both inside and out, because you want your box painted black on the inside, or you can put black paper there so you don't get multiple reflections, and you just have a white screen and everything else should be black. On the outside, it's also black because it doesn't, therefore, effect, the light doesn't affect it. And you notice in, in sports and games when people play um, football or other sports, they often put black makeup under their eyes. It's not necessary to cover the whole face in makeup and wear a black shirt. I suppose that might be the ideal uh, vision to be able to see the best, but it's sufficient to simply put black around the eyes so that you don't get reflections, spurious reflections. And that uh, provides better vision. So if you were trying to see better, and this I do notice this, that I can see better when I'm wearing a black shirt and black pants, so I've always bought black clothing because it helps me see better. And so, for example, if you're welding something and you have uh, light-colored pants, as you light up the arc welder, the bright light from your pants uh, shines up underneath the welding helmet and actually makes it hard to see. It's much, much easier to see if you're wearing black clothes when you're welding, for example, and there's stray light leaks somewhere. And so what you want to do is apply something, either coating black paper or black paint, inside, for sure inside, and also possibly outside. Now, a lot of times cameras are made in other colors as a fashion statement, uh, like this one here, it's kind of made in this silver color, and you see a lot of cameras, they started to make them in fashionable colors that are not black, but that comes at a performance pr uh, penalty. So that, that comes at the price of reduced performance. So now you can see these cameras have a lens on the front, and there's a viewfinder. And that lens, the other thing that that lens will often have, this lens is just a magnifying glass, but some of the lenses will have this thing called an aperture or an iris uh, in the lens. And that allows you to open and close the lens and make the lens bigger or smaller. Because you could ask yourself the question, I'll show this up close, 
So this is a lens that has an iris in it. And as I close the iris, the lens effectively gets smaller. So you can ask yourself, should I use a big lens or a small lens? And the question, that, the answer depends. A big lens lets in more light and has a narrower depth of field. A small lens lets in less light and has a broader depth of field or depth of focus. And we might choose in photography, sometimes we want a narrow depth of focus, so we'll use a big lens. Other times we want a big depth of focus. We want to take a picture of somebody and we want the background to be sharp. If you want to photograph somebody and make the background blurry, you open up the lens aperture. But if you want to take a picture of somebody and have the background be sharp and also have the person be sharp, then you use a small aperture. And when you use a small aperture, of course, you need more light. The camera becomes less sensitive to light. So you might need a longer exposure, which means there's a risk that the person will be blurry. They used to have Brady stands to hold people in place, to hold people still during the exposure, like a cast iron stand that would hide behind the person and hold their body still. Uh, but uh, uh, the, And the other thing is, if your lens is, if, if your lens is small aperture, you can also use a higher ISO film or a more sensitive sensor, which introduces noise, of course, or film grain as other artifacts. So that aperture or iris determines what the f number is, and that de that is basically the the distance that this uh, distance here and the diameter of this opening. And this f number is the ratio of the diameter of this opening to the distance away, the distance of focus that the lens is. So now, uh, when that n number, so if we have like f22, for example, that number versus say f2, 2.0, this is a, a larger opening, this ratio, and this is a smaller opening. And if you look at these lenses, some of them are marked what those openings are. There's little markings on the side of them. And that ratio, if you look at the markings, they'll typically be like you'll have f, 1.4, 2, 2.8, 4, 5.6, 8, 11, 16, 32, 16, 22, 32, 64, and so on, 32, 45, and then 64. And so these numbers, uh, what these numbers are is they're the ratio of the, the size of the opening to the distance away. and these ratios increase by a factor of the square root of 2 each time. And the reason that they increase by the square root of 2 each time is because that's a doubling of the amount of light. So if I have a particular size opening, and I grow it to the square root of 2 times larger in diameter, if the diameter is square root of 2 times bigger, then the area is twice what it was before. So these numbers have special meaning, and that is that each one lets in half the amount of light as the previous one. So if you're at f1.4 and you close down to f2, you get half the light. If you close down to 2.8, you get half of that. 4, you get half of that again. So you notice these are doubling, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and 64. Each is, if you skip two f-stops, if you close the camera two f-stops, you've cut the light to a quarter. You, when you cut the diameter in half, the light is a quarter of what it was before. Now, if we look at these cameras, I want to look now at an older, simpler camera. And I'm going to switch back to my main camera here. And if I look at this camera here, let's get a little bit of light on that. I'm just going to turn up my top light here. There it is. 
So if you look at this camera here, this is a good example of a camera. It has, on the front of it, it has a lens. And on the back of it, it has a ground glass so you can see the image on the ground glass. That's the viewfinder. So this is the viewfinder here, and this is the lens up here. And the viewfinder here allows you to see what the image is. And it's very nice to study these older technologies because they're very transparent. Uh, we'll call alethism, the lack of hiding things. A lot of modern things, they try their best to hide how they work. But the older things like this, it's easy to see and understand how they work. So it's really hard to invent the future without studying the past. If you want to invent the future, you have to understand the past. You have to understand how things work fundamentally. And if you can understand fundamental physics and how things work, it helps greatly understand the world and the universe. I've got a shotgun mic here, so I should be able to put down my handheld and you, can, you guys can still hear me. I think, let me know if you have any trouble hearing me. This ground glass here, if I take that off, it's very simple. It's just a piece of glass and if I hold it up to the window you can see it's, you can kind of see the light filtering through it um, completely diffuse you can kind of see as it goes into the brighter window you can see it get brighter and as I come over here into the darker part of the room it gets darker behind it in fact if I put my hand there you can see my hand will cast an image there you can see my hand it's it's where if I put my hand right against it you can see my hand but as I take my hand away it becomes blurry pretty quickly. So this ground glass, it's glass. It's, it's called ground glass. It's glass that's been ground or sanded. The sand to make it diffuse. And when I look in the camera, the camera is really just a big box of nothing. There's nothing inside this box. It's just a big box of air, I suppose. And these leather bellows here keep the light from getting in. You could make a camera like this out of anything you want, uh, cardboard, wood. You could make it out of cloth if you wanted to. This one's made out of leather, and the bellows are flexible, so they can flex. And I can talk about that a little bit, too. And so this, this uh, <coughs> ground glass then takes a holder. There's a holder here uh, that allows one to slide in film or glass plates sensitized glass plates, negatives, photographic negatives typically could be positives, but usually we use negatives, glass plates that are sensitized. And you drop it in here, you go in the dark room and load the plates into the plate holders and then slide them into here and then develop them. In previous years before the pandemic, uh, I built a big dark room. I'm at home in my house. Um, I live with my wife and two children upstairs and downstairs here is my lab. And what I used to do is I made a big giant dark room in the back that was big enough to take the whole class in. And I taught everybody how to develop film or photographic materials. And so what I did is each person in the class got to shoot a picture with a negative and develop it using this camera here and understanding it. But I can certainly show, show some of that, how it works and how to, how to make these things. So this ground glass goes here over the back and then the image appears on there and if I point this out the window there you can actually see the image on the back there of the ground glass just like you will see in when you do lab one and then now this lens this is a early electric uh, electrically controlled lens and this lens on the lens board can move up and down like this. You can see that lens moves up like this or down like this and it moves in various ways. This thing can move sideways. This thing you'll notice here, it can move this way sideways, left or right. The little board in here can even tilt and it can, it can tilt to varying degrees forwards and backwards. So it has quite a bit of freedom to move around and thus you can sculpt or shape the image the way in which the image is, is positioned, the perspective control of the image and how it's aligned and so on. And that gives you a great deal of freedom and creative control, artistic control and scientific accuracy over how the image is done, how the imaging is done.
Now let me switch back to camera two with picture in picture. See on my uh, my first camera, you can see I've got the aperture and shutter speeds indicated there, so it's kind of nice to be able to see that. Since I'm a little further from that shotgun mic, I'll use the handheld as well. So now, what we have is kind of an evolution of photography from a dark room. Uh, that you go inside to a dark room that you don't go inside. So for lab one, you're going to build a small camera and a big camera. The small one is going to be one that you look inside, and the big camera is going to be ideally one that you can go inside, like a room, that you can turn a room into a camera by simply uh, putting some black uh, cardboard over the window or black paper over the window and making a small hole in it, for example. And there's an instructable on how to do that. You use the instructables.com. And so the large camera, you could see it from the inside, and the small camera, you're seeing it from the outside. And of course, the whole, the calculation of the whole size and everything mm -hmm. will be different in those two cases, and that will give you some insight. And it, you could ask a question, is which camera gives you more resolution? Is it better to have a big camera or a small camera in terms of seeing fine detail? So you can go through the math there, and that gets kind of fun as well. Here's a nice little camera. This is a folding camera. A little pocket camera. The idea is to, was to make photography portable so that you could carry this camera around wherever you went. And so this camera, this camera folds up. And here it is. So I'm opening it now. The film goes in here. There's a roll of photographic film that goes in here. And then the camera opens like this. It's beautiful the way it opens. It just folds out like this. And now it's ready to use, of course. And you put your film in here in the back and close it up so it's dark inside there. And then you've got this camera here like this. And there's a shutter release here. And you'll notice the markings on here. There's the time. The shutter speeds are, um, if you look at the shutter speed, it goes a 400th, a 200th, 1/100th, 50th, 25th, and so on. And they go down in factors of two, each one twice as long as the other one. And then there's the aperture here, which goes f5.6, f8, f11, f16, f22, f32, each of those is the square root of 2. So each time you turn this one click position to the next one, the opening is uh, the square 1 over the square root of 2 times the size of the previous one. And that, thus they work together. If you, if you close this down one half stop, then you need twice as much time on this dial here. And then there's a focus knob here which turns the lens focusing close. And then the shutter. There's another setting here called B and T, and these are both infinity, bulb and toggle. So the idea is when you put the camera on B, the shutter stays open as long as you hold this down. And that's infinite duration. The exposure can be as long as you want. And then when you let go of it, it closes. And so that's useful for a bulb if you're doing a flash bulb or flash powder. What people used to do is put the camera on B, open it up, and then ignite the flash powder or the magnesium to get the light for the exposure, and then they'd close the shutter again. Now what that does is gives you all kinds of creative possibilities because what we used to do is create multiple flash bulbs. You know, you can open up the camera and do a whole bunch of exposures and then let it close. So one of my favorite childhood hobbies was photographing electromagnetic radio waves and sound waves using lock-in amplifiers and arrays of light bulbs. So I used to have all kinds of fun with light bulbs and cameras and everything as I was growing up. And so that kind of developed a deep understanding of cameras and photography and imaging and image sensing.
And then as we move through the history of photography into, into more modern cameras and more modern image sensors, we see kind of an evolution from film-based cameras to computational cameras and sensing. And so, for example, we've got video cameras that are electrical. And so this is a typical video camera. This is a camera that has this dark dome in there. And if you look in here, there's a dark dome around this camera. And inside, if you look very carefully, you can see a camera in there, kind of hidden inside this dome. And if you look carefully in that dome, what you see is you can, you can have a dark dome, this, this dark material that kind of hides the camera. So you might have a surveillance camera here. And then what they do is they put a dark dome around it to make it harder to see which way the camera's pointing. So it's hard to see that camera moving around in a security camera. And so these domes of wine dark opacity, they let through some of the light and they block others. So if this dome let through uh, let's say you had a dome that let through only 10% of the light. So if only 10% of the light got in there, the camera uh, sees times one-tenth. But uh, a person being able to see inside the camera, the light then has to go back out of here. So the light shines in and it's one-tenth. And then the light to see the camera in the dome, it comes back out, and it's another one-tenth. So it's one one-hundredth uh, of the light that comes in. So when you're trying to see in that dome, you've got the disadvantage of going through twice. So it's one one-hundredth. Only one percent of the light goes in and back out again for you to be able to see. But the camera can see it only gets a loss of, of, of uh, times one-tenth. But when you're trying to look in and see it, it's a loss of one one-hundredth. So if you have this thing, if some small amount of ep light epsilon gets through, then the amount that goes in and back out again is epsilon squared, which is very close to zero. And so in some sense, these dark domes are able to hide which way the camera's aimed because it goes through twice. And the other thing to notice is there's a dark shroud in there. There's a piece of metal that's been cut out uh, so that it blocks light from getting in the dome and keeps it really dark in there to hide the camera better. So in addition to having the dark dome, there's a dark metal shroud that comes inside the dome, a dark piece of black metal that moves together with the camera. And that black metal keeps further light from getting in and stops light from getting into the dome and keeps it dark inside. Here's another thing. This is a street light controller. You notice the street light controller is similar. When you're outside this controller trying to look in, it's really hard to see in there. It looks dark. But if you look at it from the inside, you can see out. So see, notice how it's a lot easier to see out of that, uh, to see, to, to look out from inside than it is to see, to see from outside, to see inside. So if I put an object in here, like if, if there was a small camera like this, you got all these, well these are little USB camera. If you had a small USB camera which charges up over USB and then wirelessly transmits some of these will work with a Vuzik smart swim, by the way, they're wireless. You can transmit there. If I put that camera in there and then put that dome over there, it's very hard to see that camera. So it can see you very easily, but it's very difficult for you to see it. And so that's kind of this principle. Now, if further that this thing has a mirrored surface, then it's even harder to see it because it shows reflections of the room around it and further obscures its vision. So we have this notion of surveillance in which the camera is watching us, but we don't see it. And so that we often talk about that as being surveillance, which is a French word. Sur means over, and valence or vele means sight, so the closest English. And then there's another word Surveillance. Sue is French for under. 
that means under sight. And in the Oxford English Dictionary, the OED defines surveillance in terms of, you know, people photographing the police or whatever, in reverse of the police photographing the people. But we can look at this in much broader sense and think of this as sensing in general, uh, for AI to be able to be sensed and understood by people, for example. So this surveillance is things watching us, and surveillance is when we're watching things. And so when we're doing the sensing. So this is a very broad concept that goes beyond how people have defined it in common everyday use to a deeper philosophical underpinning behind the concept of AI and understandable, explainable AI that's explainable without special requests. So we'll talk a lot about those kinds of things. And generally how these cameras work, there's, it's quite fascinating how these cameras work. And so surveillance is often in the world of wearable cameras, small wearable things like this, various types of devices that are that are, you know, wearable imaging and wearable display and virtual reality, mediated reality, augmented reality, and X reality. Charles Wyckoff and I come up with the term X reality in 1991. So this is kind of a, 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 an overview an understanding of what a camera is and how it works. And what I want you all to get from this is an understanding, a really fundamental understanding of how image, how imaging works, how image sensing works, and generally how much of these, these processes operate from a fundamental physics point of view. And we'll get into all kinds of fun things like there's many different aspects of, of imaging, you know, HDR imaging, quantigraphic imaging, what, how much uh, light comes in. So one of the things in this course that we'll touch on is the amount of light that comes in. So light enters this, and there's some kind of an image sensor there that quantifies how much light. So what I looked at is trying to make the camera function as a scientific measuring instrument. And that was with the invention of HDR, was this notion of quantigraphic imaging. So we can look at this in a scientific context using two things. There's two things we want to look at is algebraic projective geometry, and we want to look at quantigraphics. So one is spatial, and the other is, is in the amplitude domain, space domain and amplitude domain. So we can talk about space and spatial frequency, spatial domain. You can talk about Fourier theory, which is spatial frequency, let's say, and temporal frequency and temporal domain. Space-time continuum, let's say this is. Space-time continuum in the Fourier domain, so the space-time, you know, the four-dimensional space-time space or the eight-dimensional uh, space-time, spatial frequency, temporal frequency space. In the time frequency analysis, it's an eight-dimensional space. And we can also look at the quantigraphic, meaning what that is in the amplitude domain, how much of something is present. A lot of people were looking at this, but nobody was looking at this, so I kind of first asked that question. And that was with the invention of HDR and being on digital, if you search the paper, being on digital. is kind of where that started off. So we'll get into a lot of different things in this course about how cameras work, how things are imaged, how to use the eye itself as a camera, even you know if you want to work with the brain sensing. And Lab 1 will hopefully give you an introduction, a very nice introduction, and in how are you going to build a camera, how are you going to make a camera. You're going to have an opening in it, you're going to have an aperture, you're going to start to understand this concept of aperture. Here's a Polaroid instant camera that I've taken apart, and you can see here there is this aperture, which is just a little opening here and it slides back and forth so that it can either be present or absent. It can either slide out of the way. Uh, with this opening it says 3000 ISO. So for black and white film, it's closed down to this real small hole at 3000 ISO. When you put color film in, it slides across. So there's 
for 75 or 80 ISO color film, you can actually see quite a bit through that lens. And then when you're shooting black and white, which is faster film at 3000 ISO, uh, it closes down to that little hole there, that tiny little hole, and you can see a little bit of light coming through that tiny little hole there. You can still see it. I think you can still kind of see there when I open it there versus closed. You can see the increase or decrease in the amount of light that comes through. And so this is, you're going to learn about apertures and exposure, how much light is present and what happens when you have less light or more light and also how the image sharpness depends on the size of the opening and does it scale? Does the small camera scale to the big? If you increase the scale, like, like a question you can ask is, does a little camera like this, can a little camera like this take as good of a picture as a big camera in terms of fundamental physics? Let's say this, you know, even my phone, my smartphone, it's 108 megapixels. It's got a lot of megapixels in it. Samsung S21, this is uh, similar to the Xiaomi, the little rice Xiaomi um, product. And uh, so this, this phone has lots of megapixels, but the camera's small. Can it fundamentally take, from a scientific point of view, as sharp of a picture? Why are cameras sometimes larger? You know, is there a size advantage? Does a bigger camera potentially have more resolving power? What is the resolving power? What is the fundamental physics about what can be measured and how? What happens when we scale the camera down? Do we lose something by scaling it down small versus large? And I want you to think about that in lab one. You're going to be making a small camera and a big camera. Is bigger better? And if so, why? Prove it mathematically. OK, so I hope that was fun. And we shall meet again next week. And I want you to give me some feedback. Let me know if this live uh, lecture format works out good. We're trying to commit ourselves to simple open source tools and keep everything easy. Let me know if this is working for everybody. And uh, <clears throat> until next time, that was super lots of fun. That was a lot of fun, and I, I hope you had fun as well. So thank you very much.